Businesses thrive by knowing customer insights because today's insights are tomorrow's facts. At iResearch, we live and breathe insights. And despite searching high and low, we were unable to find a customer insights podcast that answers one of the most important questions in business. Why do customers do what they do? So we launched one. Hi, I'm your host, Darshan Mehta. Today, I'd like to welcome John Zogby. He is a senior partner at John Zogby Strategies. It's a full-service market research political consulting firm that provides a wide range of opinion services. Uh, John has been featured on all the networks as an election analyst. He has also been published in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and other publications around the world. And he's also the author of three books, and I understand a new manuscript that we're going to talk about today as well. So welcome, John. Thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure, Darson. I've been looking forward to this. You know, I'm curious, you have a bachelor's degree in history. And so I want to know, how did you, what's your journey to get to polling and opinion research? And what are some of the pivotal or aha moments you've had along the way? Two strands. One is, um, as a history student and then historian, um, always fascinated by elections, all the details of elections. As I got older, as I was developing, the polling industry was developing. And I was may, amazed that those days in the late 60s, 70s, the accuracy, Gallup and Harris and Roper, um, just amazing to me that that could be done, you know, with relatively small samples. And at the same time, I'm a left-wing political activist, um, on campus and then in my hometown, upstate New York, ultimately leading me to run for mayor of my little city, Utica, New York. I lost, but I did a poll with my students. And this is absolutely true. I knew exactly how much I was going to lose by. And I thought, um, this is fun. Um, I'd rather be right than president, to quote uh, a former vice president of the United States. And so there I was. Um, I, I left teaching, took a job as a, as an Arab American uh, organizer, afforded me the opportunity to meet a lot of people, and within a few years started my consulting practice. But even then, 1984, the one thing that I did that was unique that no one else was doing was polling in local races, you know, presidential, gubernatorial, U.S. Senate the bigger races, Congress, but nobody was polling the sheriff and the, and, and the town supervisor and the county executive. And so the, I sort of grabbed that market for myself back then. It's interesting. So what was it about polling that really attracted you? Um, or, or I guess, uh, you know, elections and polling, what, what was it that really attracted you at that time? You know, to any good researcher, I think, you want accurate data coming in. But, you know, as an historian, I want a story that emerges. And this was a perfect blend. Here I was able not simply to learn and then subsequently tell a story, but to have good data to back it up. You know, to not live only on conjecture alone, but to be able to ground those stories, those lessons, those answers to questions, those speculations, those projections into the future with hard data. And so for me, it was it was like a perfect marriage. So to a layman who may not know polling versus surveys and stuff, how would you uh, describe polling to them? Well, polling is the act of seeking public opinion, you know, in, a, in its uh, broadest sense, uh, no matter who the demagogue is or who the king is or who the, the city manager is, what are the people thinking, you know? And there are a multitude of ways of, of getting at that. You send precinct captains out, you send uh, the folks around you out and talk to a few people, come back to me, what are the folks thinking? Polling, you know, in the last almost century now, is a scientific way of gathering public opinion. Random probability sampling, you know, using the right method and the right form, the ability to ask 
fair, balanced questions, um, you know, and to be able to draw from the public uh, not only how many support or oppose or how many feel one way or feel another way, but also there's frequency, but there's also um, intensity. And that's what I think that opinion polling gets at. So I'm able to measure not if you support or oppose um, a policy, but do you strongly support, somewhat so support, somewhat oppose, strongly oppose. We get levels of intensity too, because that drives people's behavior even more so than frequency. Mm -hmm. So you're known for accurate polling analysis and insights, and especially in the world of American politics. So I'm curious, you've been doing this for over 30 years. How has your approach changed over the years? Well, I'm going to grab a prop here. You see this? That is a landline telephone. When I started, do you remember these? <laughs> when, when I started in 1984, 96, almost 97% of American households uh, had a landline telephone. Uh, let's call that everybody. Uh, in addition to that, socially and culturally, when I started, there were uh, th th there was a sense that it's a courtesy to answer the phone. Shh, somebody's calling me from New York with a lot of questions. This is important. They want to know my opinion. So we had uh, uh, 65 percent response rates. So 97 percent had the phones. People socially and culturally answered the phone. At that point in 1984, the so-called answering machine was still a novelty. Uh, and, and so obviously what's changed is technology on one hand, but also um, the fact that fewer people are home, fewer people are home at the dinner hour. Um, women are the fastest growing element and have been in the workforce. And so they're not around. Uh, it's no longer deemed impolite, it's standard. If you don't answer the phone, that's an invasion of privacy. So you've got both of these strains going. One is the technology is saying fewer people have landlines. So, I mean, we're at a point now where 70 plus percent of the telephones in this country are cell phones. Talk about invasion of privacy. Get a call on your cell phone. That's 10 times worse than if you're sitting at home and can ignore it. Um, but also the fact that ignoring the telephone has become fairly standard. Well, now so, it also has caller ID too, right? So that, that makes that's a big hurdle too. <laughs> it, it, it really is. And so uh, in our case, um, we have over the last 23 years started researching and developing the online poll. We were ahead of the game in that. There were early difficulties, but now among likely voters, 94% of likely voters have internet access, either at home or via the second prop, the mobile phone. Um, and we are able to reach them with reasonable response rates, either directly by phone or more than likely text to web send you a message saying, if you'd like to take the survey, uh, here's a secure website. Uh, it can't be gamed. You can't forward it. Um, and it is a, a, a good research tool. Most of our polls are, are conducted uh, via online in some way, shape, or form. And so how difficult is it to basically get a cross-section uh, representative sample now, or, or is it actually easier? Okay, in some respects, it's easier uh, because there's been a democratization of the mobile phone and the internet, uh, and um, texting or emailing someone, inviting them to a survey, is not only less invasive, but it also it enables them to take it at their own leisure. So, uh, all right, I got a survey to do. I can't do it right now, um, but I'll do it later. And so we get a lot of people who take surveys after 11 p.m. local time 
Uh, in addition to that, uh, in the old days, you couldn't call anybody on holidays, to be sure. Now, uh, tongue-in-cheek, that's a prime time. You have, believe it or not, lots of people out there who've had it up to here with family by about 2 or 3 o'clock on, on Christmas Day or New Year's Day, or something, and they can't wait to go to their own room or their own place or sit in the car and answer a survey. I'm being a little facetious. But the point is the, the society and culture has changed, as has the technology. Bottom line, our studies find we get a better distribution of our sample online than we do traditional uh, our telephone. However, there are some surveys we still have to do by, by telephone, just by virtue of if I'm doing a smaller community, then I have to rely on the, on the telephone. Mm -hmm. And are you seeing uh, larger sample sizes as well? Are you actually doing larger sample sizes than you used to before? Uh, we can, yeah. Uh, I mean, normally we're doing, you know, the usual thousand or twelve hundred or so for a nationwide survey. A little less um, for uh, uh, statewide or market-wide regional market surveys. But no, we have the capacity online to, in seventy-two hours. Uh, get a sample of 10,000 consumers or 10,000 voters. <clears throat> it all depends on how many we decide to invite. If I could just follow up on that. The invitation is we have tens of millions of email addresses and or um, uh, uh, cell phone numbers for texting purposes. <clears throat> uh, where the science comes in, that, those samples are already representative geographically, by race, by gender, education, and so on. What we'll do is we'll do, then do a random probability sampling of those millions and then invite, say, 10,000 to do the survey. And so that's where the random sampling comes in. Mm -hmm. In the last couple of national elections in the U.S., there's been, it seems, a disconnect between polling and results, election results. What do you think is behind this disconnect? Okay, there's a lot of things, but I, I can tell you, I did not poll 2016. I did poll 2020 and I nailed it. But I will start with 2016 because I, I can be totally objective. Um, the, the polls were fine. It was pundits that just either didn't know how to read them or didn't want to read them. Now, allow me a, a, a minute here or so, but if you looked at the conglomeration of polls nationally and in the battleground states, there were direction signals that were as clear as clear can be. Take the battleground states. If you looked at the sun, two Sundays before the election, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, North Carolina, uh, Florida, with the exception of Florida, you saw Hillary leading by nine 10, 11 percentage points. And daily, as new polls came out, you saw her lead dwindling each day to the point where the day before the election, uh, what you saw was either Trump leading in North Carolina or Hillary's lead dissipating from uh, 11 to 3 in Pennsylvania or 12 to 2 in Michigan. Point being, a seasoned observer would look at that and say, the trajectory is wrong here for Hillary Clinton. Something is about to happen. Not quite sure, but it looks like something is happening. That's how I interpreted it in all my writings. The pundits expect the polls to be dead on. In other words, if the poll comes out and says Hillary Clinton is ahead by two points in New Hampshire, that means she's got to win by two points in New Hampshire. And no, you've got to look more sophisticated um, and look at, you know, be nuanced. In other words, there were direction signals that were very serious in those polls. And the same thing with 2020. Uh, 20. So, some, um, some polls just blew it. I mean, ABC News. Um, few days before the election had uh, Hillary, uh, uh, Joe Biden 
leading by 17 points in Wisconsin. Well, that's a bad poll. And those do happen. Uh, I know. I've done a bad poll here or there over the last 38 years. It, it does happen. But by and large, I think the polls behaved well in 2020 as well. I think the real challenge also with polls is not just that, you know, that uh, is uh, what are, are people leaning one way or the other in terms of the candidates, but it's hard to predict how many are actually going to show up to vote, right? That is so very true. Um, uh, there are signals, but uh, this is the artistry in our business is getting what is called the turnout model. You know, so, I mean, if we're pure scientists, um, and are not talking to the press, or at least a one-dimensional press, what we're doing is saying, well, under these circumstances, if the black turnout is 10% of the total and the young turnout is 15% of the total, this is what's going to happen. On the other hand, if the black turnout is 12% and the young voters are 17%, here's what's going to happen. That's for a sophisticated media and a sophisticated media that wants to impart information. But if we're playing the Kentucky Derby here alone, and -and so-and-so sports is going to win by a length, well, if he wins by two lengths, the the odds makers were wrong. So, but yeah, uh, we are standing on tectonic plates here. Remember, remember 10 to 14% tell us that they make up their minds on election day. So, yeah, we got a lot going on here in the field, but it's still a good one. Sure. I mean, everybody's looking for some type of indication as to what's going to happen and uh, get a little bit of uh, insight into the future. In polling, when you ask someone a yes, no question, you can't gauge the level of a respondent's yes or no, and you can't hear from those who can't say yes or no. As a result of this limitation, do you think that Polling has led to a more divided country? You know, that's a very good question. First of all, I never ask uh, yes, no, agree, disagree, believe, not believe. What I want to know is a Likert scale. Do you strongly agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, strongly disagree, or don't you have enough information? Make a judgment. It it offers the respondent a range. Um, But From that question alone, I'm able to get an agree to disagree ratio, whether it's a majority or or not a majority. Um, But I'm also able to measure degrees of intensity. If most of the folks who agree strongly agree and fewer of those who disagree strongly disagree, I'm going to say the strongly agrees have it. When it comes to you know, some of the really hot button issues of the day, guns, always gay marriage, uh, to be sure, abortion. I look at not only, let's say, the 57, 58% who are pro-choice, but I also look at uh, the, the strongly pro-life. And if that is stronger than the number who are strongly pro, uh, pro-choice, then I know that high intensity group is going to dictate this issue. They're going to dictate the terms of the election. They're going to be on the offensive. That tells me a whole lot more than the simple uh, percentage of agree, disagree. So I, uh, I, I don't use two point questions, agree, disagree. Yeah, I was just giving that example. But I mean, I think what I'm trying to say is that there's more finite choices and a lot of it depends on, I guess, the wording of the choices that are given in the survey, and that's that's where the art comes in as well. Um, but uh, but you do both qualitative and quantitative, so I'm wondering how do you strike the balance? And I think you see, you I think you told me you have a preference for one or the other, right? Uh, I do, just in terms of liking it. Remember, I'm a historian. I like stories, and um, and I like people to tell the stories. Um, but I do quantitative research for for purposes of accuracy. Um, so if you're telling me a story, well, what's your context? I mean, are you telling me something from the point of view of 10% of the public agreeing with you? Or are you telling me something from the vantage point of 60% agree with you? So, you know, you need those numbers, but 
by the same token, in terms of conducting our work, I, I love focus groups. I love one-on-one -on -one interviews. I love to be able to engage people, to flesh out um, not only their feelings, but what drives them. One thing I, I particularly like that few of us really do is I look at a person and I don't ask, who are you today? That's a part of it. But I want to know, who do you want to be? Tell me what your aspirations are. So whether I'm uh, counseling a mentee or interviewing someone who is an influencer in their community, I don't simply want to know, how do you see yourself, your community, your product today? How do you envision it 10 years down the road? How do you, uh, for mentees, what do you want to, what do you see yourself being at the age of 35? What are you doing at 52? That tells me something um, and also helps me then uh, engage them in strategies to get to those benchmarks. So give me an example. What type of insight have you gleaned when you've asked questions like that to, to people? All right. Well, uh, let's go back to the bailiwick, all right, and, and, uh, and politics is uh, to not only get a sense of who are you voting for today, but what do you see happening over the next 10 years? And paint me a picture of what your world looks like. Where are you in 10 years? How did you get there from there to here? Did you follow a path or is it an accident? Project yourself into the future. And that gives me then an idea of not only what, well, I don't know if people use levers anymore. I guess it's all touch screen now, but when they vote, what's, what's really behind that vote? Or is there nothing behind that vote except eeny, meeny, miny, mo? Same thing with products and brands, though, I, I have to say. Uh, I ask a lot of open-ended questions, and I, I want to know how important a brand is, what it says to you, what it speaks to you. How does it relate not only to where you are right now, but to where you want to be? Mm -hmm. You've also written uh, the book uh, about the transformation of the American dream. How has the American dream been transformed post-COVID? Yeah, that's interesting because when I wrote the book, of course, it was 14, 15 years ago. And what I, I identified then was a growing number of people, whether they had you know, made it sufficiently financially in their lives or had come to the realization that they just weren't anymore. They were moving towards a new spirituality to define the American dream, self-fulfillment, living authentically, and so on. Uh, in many ways, I think that that has accelerated. I don't believe the American dream is dead. I do believe that the American dream that's defined exclusively in materialistic terms, I want the big house, I want the pool, I want the grand vacations, I want the Ivy League schools, I want to be the CEO. I think that that's either been put on hold or become less relevant in people's lives. And what they see instead is tamp that part of me down. How do I live authentically? How do I live a, 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 a real life with real expectations that allows me then to leave this earth and say, hey, I did something. I feel fulfilled. I call that the secular spiritualism, very much alive today. Are you seeing that across all age groups or certain age groups more so than others? I saw it particularly in two age groups. This was 15 years ago. I saw, it, first of all, among boomers who had reached that point in their lives where a lot of things were going on, bordering and then into old age and then asking the question, is, is this all there is? Uh, you know, maybe I, I, I was living in a decent place. Maybe I was in a good place financially, but is this all there is? Another aspect of it was, um, all right, we ended a war and pushed for civil rights, but that's when I was 19. You know, I'm 71 now. Is there not a second act for me? How, how 
how much longer can you go on with what you did 50 years ago? Um, and there was also, you know, a, a certain jaded aspect to it. I'm not going to be CEO, you know, and I'm not going to have the big swimming pool. And so there are other things. Um, fourth great awakening is, is what one author called it. But I also saw it particularly among millennials. At the time. And now this is before Gen Z. But among millennials, that sense that, um, hey, we're, we're in a minefield. So, so much of this world is good, has been good to us. But there's no sense of permanence here. You know, I, I can't dream about getting that dream job and saying, I'm going to be doing this for 30 years. Permanence has left me. I have to leave permanence. Um, I have to steer my way through. And so for them, uh, and, and this happens to be true and true with the, the younger group of, of Gen Z, how do I make this earth a better place? How do I use my agency? Um, and, and you see among young people that when they're, when they're hired, whether it's a gig or a job, I mean, it is a demand. They want corporate social responsibility. They want to work for good citizens. They want time to be able to work in their community. Or because they're so highly networked, they want to be able to contribute in some way to people who are suffering, who now they can see, like, uh, we couldn't at their age. And so, uh, yeah, it is generationally inclined, but I, it's becoming more universal as um, uh, as boomers take over. Um, uh, the millennials are just so large, and now Gen Z is even driving this even further. Yeah, I've talked to quite a few young people, and I think those who have lived through the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, and then COVID, and now you know we're in an environment where there's an invasion of another country and uh, yeah. the prospect of a war. I think that's really heightened the uh, focus on you know doing something uh, purposeful, meaningful uh, in their life. And uh, and I'm just curious in real time when you're in your polling currently, are you seeing? these changes even more so with the current environment, with what's going on with the uh, yeah. invasion? Yeah. And the good thing is that it's not uh, the world has gone to hell in a handbasket kind of result. It's much more encouraging than that. There is a sense um, that this is an old world that's passing, uh, that, that in many ways this Russian invasion, that's so... 75 years ago, so 100 years ago. I mean, we're, they are seeing it, but you see them being active about it, whether it means making a couple of clicks and sending a, a contribution or teaming up with young people and marching, talking about it on social media. I mean, let's look at Gen Z and millennial uh, influencers. In many ways, the ones that we know about appear so incredibly selfish and self-centered, but the reality is they are helping to lead uh, a, a revolution. You know, um, uh, David Beckham, not a millennial, but here's a guy who turned his whole, uh, what is it, 2.4 million? I think it's more than that, actually. However many followers over to President Harris, uh, uh, Yaroslavsky of uh, of uh, the Ukraine, mm. Ukraine, not uh, Ukraine. My apologies. Yeah, I think it's incredible what's happening. I think you're absolutely right. There's a there's much more vested interest and engagement with trying to make a change with uh, social media and the internet now. With what's going on with this invasion. Oh, no, I just one quick point. I learned years ago because I've been studying millennials since after nine eleven. Um, that they don't see the other when they look at young people overseas. So that was a different, you know, when, when we were marching for civil rights, we were marching for them. But they're marching for us. They're contributing to us. Hey, these kids listen to the same music. They talk the same language. Um, they dress in the same clothes. You know, they're... Uh, you know, we don't want to be supporting a war against people just like us. 
they are us. They're not them. Yeah. I want to switch gears for a second to your new manuscript. It's called Polling Alone, Finding Those yeah. Moments of Clarity. Tell me what this manuscript is about and what inspired you to write it. Well, for starters, uh, my grandchildren. You know, at some point, uh, cleaning out a closet or something, I'd like my grandchildren and their grandchildren that if they ever see the name John Zogby, uh, you know, instead of saying, who was he? Here it is right here. So in this way, in this one book, and so it, it's not really an autobiography or a memoir. It's a professional um, study of the kind of work that I did, especially the projects, uh, the myriad of projects um, that worked, that, that helped people, that had those and you know these well, those aha moments, those moments of clarity. And so it wasn't just a poll that I got right in an election. It was going into a school district where there were low expectations for performance and identifying what, the, what that was and how to root it out and creating a strategic plan so that now there's an 88% graduation rate. Um, there are links with a local community college that kids can earn college credit during their senior year, that the expectations are higher. Or, you know, projects like that, um, uh, 21,000 college students worldwide in the laureate education system and asking them, what, what's the university of the future look like? And they're coming back and telling me, oh, my God. There are no textbooks. The teaching is upside down. They want the professors as mentors. They want the, um, the, the doers, the practical people who are out in the field. They want them teaching. They want more control over their own education, their own curriculum. Um, and this is what they expect. This isn't what they think about or say, oh, wouldn't it be nice? This is what they expect now um and so i mean uh, just a wild variety whether the the iranian elections of 2000 the albanian elections of 2009 and yet by the same token a little fishing village in upstate new york that needed economic development but the first thing they told me was don't scare the fish we want economic development but we want it we um are you old enough to remember the Dave Clark Five? They came out with the Beatles. The name of the place is I like it like that. That was nobody ever quotes the Dave Clark Five, but that was one thing that came to mind when I did that study thirty-two years ago. So that that's what it is. Just a whole lot of projects, including some of the ones that didn't work so hard that I learned from. So when people do polling or do surveys, what common mistakes you see people often do that uh, they can avoid? I think sometimes there's too great a reliance on random probability sampling, which in election polling uh, sometimes leaves you with political party identification that are skewed. Generally speaking, too many Democrats, too few Republicans um, in that sample, which means that it's lacking a sense of reality. And political party identification is, um, is a driving force in people. If I identify myself as a Democrat, there's an 80, 90 percent chance I'm going to vote or lean or identify with Democratic um, issues and Democratic candidates. If I'm overrepresenting uh, uh, Democrats in my sample, underrepresenting Republicans, I'm going to get skewed, skewed results. And I think that's been one of the real ironies in my life. I, I am a progressive Democrat, and yet I became a poster child for the right wing in the 1990s that loved my polls because I was creating a I, I, was, I was weighting up the numbers of Republicans in my sample to be properly representative, and I was getting them right, and getting them right, and getting them right. 
and a few pollsters followed that lead. Others chose rather to attack it and say that it was unscientific. So you're in the world of marketing. Do you remember Charlie the Tuna? That commercial, Star Kiss Tuna? He was always dressed to the, the gills and uh, sunglasses. He wanted to be a Star Kiss Tuna. And the tagline at the end always is, sorry, Charlie, Star Kiss wants tunas, uh, don't want tunas that with good taste. They want tunas that taste good. So other cultures were doing them right, but getting them wrong. Apparently, I was doing them wrong and getting them right. <laughs> but I think that's a terrible thing. Looking back in your career, uh, are there some highlights that really fueled your passion for conducting opinion research? Well, I've got to say the 1996 presidential election. I, I got the results there not only got them to the tenth of a percent, you know, and that uh, there's divine intervention involved in that when that happens, but everybody else got it hugely wrong. And so that, um, that, that certainly was a high point for me coming back to the 2000 election, being the only one showing Al Gore winning the popular vote. Nobody else had that, that validated. Uh, everything, but there are there are high points. Um, I honestly I love it when I can go into a school district and identify an issue that if I don't identify it can metastasize and create a real problem for not only today but for a generation, and then to be able to sit down with leaders and with parents and with students and say, here's step-by-step step how you change your course. So there are, are, are lots of examples of, and I, they're all in the, in, in the manuscript. I don't know when the book's coming out, but hopefully in 2022, it, it's done. It's now we're shopping it around. Okay. So I'm curious, are you in a position to give us some insights as to what to expect in the upcoming uh, midterm elections, as well as even potentially the next uh, presidential election for the U.S.? Sure. As long as everybody realizes that I get to renew these every few months or so, because as you know, you know, I used to say anything can happen. Well, when Donald Trump elected, anything happened. I mean, that was. Wow. So anything can happen. Today, the Republicans would win control of the House of Representatives and pick up a few seats in the U.S. Senate. Um, Democratic Party is split. Uh, I don't have to list inflation, um, the stolen election uh, idea, the uh, critical race theory those kinds of issues that are being used against uh, Democrats. The built-in um, structure of the House of Representatives that favors Republicans. And the, and the degree to which Democrats are sanctimonious and didactic as they approach people. Um, by the same token, the Republicans face some serious problems that could uh, undo them. One of which is obviously this notion of a stolen election and the conspiracy theory abound, uh, uh, that, that abounds. That probably will continue to be an automatic 42% of the vote for Republican candidates, even going into 2024. But the more they, the party goes down that road, the um, less chance they have of getting the next nine or 10 percent that they need um, to win elections. And so uh, that's why I think we're in a very dynamic situation. You see the Republican Party uh, splitting and splitting over over this issue. Um, there's a lot going on. One of the things that I, I did have noticed is that some Republicans, including Donald Trump, 
are now getting double digit support among blacks. Democrats see every black vote that they could get. Now, 11% of the black vote for Republicans is not good. But when you have states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and North Carolina, states that are so razor thin um, in, in determining the winner, then wow, a few thousand black votes going to the Republican side could really uh, uh, turn the tables. So today, score them for the Republicans, but it, this isn't over. I'm curious, what impact do you think this invasion that's going on in the Ukraine and also what's happening with the news outlets in Russia, how is that, I guess, uh, affecting the view of what's been happening in, in the U.S. and about the election being stolen and, and the various uh, things, you know, with what's happening with our news as well in, in the U.S.? Well, first of all, I'm glad you asked that because that is one of the things that's tearing the Republican Party apart. You know, the uh, Trump and the MAGA followers have leaned towards Putin in their desire to be America first and to be isolationist. They've really tilted overboard to the point where among them, Putin is regarded as, as, as clever, as a good operator, but as somebody that we're not going to challenge. On the other hand, I think that Putin has has created a sense of national unity in this country um, that we haven't seen before, and a global restoration of the view of the United States of America worldwide. Um, we may be limited, we are limited what we can do militarily, but the U.S. still kind of represents a moral force, or America represents a a moral force to people. So that's one piece of it. And I think it's all age groups. And I think it benefits Joe Biden. It will benefit Joe Biden that we're not going to war because people who are watching closely understand, look, bombing feels good, you know, for six, eight, 10 hours. But the impact of that can be devastating, not the least of which is devastating. Uh, World War III. Um, the second piece of it is that there's turmoil in Russia. Um, and I think that as we're beginning to see, there's turmoil in the presidential suite there. You know, there are reports of a possible coup or possible poisoning uh, of Vladimir Putin. Not that we that we see Russia get anybody a better, you know, there there is not a Thomas Jefferson uh, waiting in the wings, but probably somebody who's rational, now, awful, autocratic, but rational. And this invasion just made absolutely no sense whatsoever to Russia at all, making less sense every day. They can't afford a war of attrition because um, they've got moms and dads, right? over there that the that don't want that they've got one would think hundreds of thousands of people uh thousands being arrested so i wouldn't be surprised if you saw a russian spring of some sort and then some some chaos and then maybe there was a third question to that no i think you covered i think it's interesting i think this is this could be one of those uh, events that can really change things quite a bit as well. You know, like you, so. everyone's kind of going in one direction, but all of a sudden an event like this occurs on a worldwide level, you know, I mean, also on the heels of COVID, that could really change things in, a, in another direction for sure. So only time will tell. Yeah, it really can. And, and especially with, um, um, you know, we are in the midst of a revolution. All of our old institutions uh, do not offer the comfort and security that people are looking for. And so we're in this very difficult period of creative destruction. They are falling apart. You know, you tick them off, not only government, not only politics, you know, the church, you know, not only attendance, but the leadership and hierarchy, so on. The Boy Scouts, the, you, you name it. Um, who do young people trust? I mean, I'm a father and a grandfather, 
Uh, what do I say? They'll go talk to your priest. No, I think that's the last person I want to send them to, you know. Um, but with that said, what will emerge is better. It's just, wow, we got to live through this first. Yeah, uh, through the transition. Before, <laughs> before the transition. And it's hard. It's very hard. What do you see on the horizon that you think is going to impact the way research will be conducted in the future? Do you know, obviously there's big data. And then we get into brainwave data. And we get into the computer chip right in the brain where you, you go, you'd go down the supermarket like this and your groceries are bought. Although I'd love to see the technology where after the groceries are purchased, a robot picks them up, takes them home, and puts them away in your shelves. Now, that will be a revolution. Um, but seriously, um, there'll be that capacity. But I like to call what we do small data. I don't think it's ever going to replace you and I talking to each other, getting a handle on, on what really, what's important. Um, what I mean, I could look at your credit card purchases, you know, or a robot can look at your credit card purchases and tell a lot of stuff about you, but I'm pointing to my heart. It's never going to get there. That's going to require humanness. That's why I don't believe that, you know, an old polling and focus group company is going to go out of fashion. In fact, business is pretty good, to tell you the truth. I agree. Uh, is there an area of polling or research that you would still like to delve into uh, further and why? Yeah. Yeah. My, my third book was about America's neo-tribes um, and how uh, rather than uh, e e e uh, us sitting around a conference table saying, let's test this, let's test that, what we did was we created a typology completely blank slate from the bottom up. We asked people, What's the motto that defines your life? What are the two most defining moments in your life? What brand speaks to you? If you could summarize your aspirations in one sentence, what would that sort of thing? We tabulated all those on sheets of paper the hard way, came up with 11 neo tribes. We unfortunately put it on hold. Business got busier and we just didn't have the bandwidth to continue. But I think. You know, our preliminary studies showed that, that these self-identified tribes that were based on character traits and aspirations were more predictive of behavior than uh, factors like race and, and income and religion and so on. I'd love to pursue that, but time, time is the issue. Yeah. So who in the world of market research or polling would you love to have lunch with and why? Well, honestly, somebody that I know quite well. I, I like Frank Luntz. I like Frank Luntz a lot. Uh, Republican, pollster. Um, uh, I, uh, I would say that I agree with Frank on things maybe 2% of the time. But I also like the fact that, you know, I'm a maverick in this business. And Frank's a maverick in the business. And he and I have always gotten along when we've chatted in a hotel lobby or at a back of the room at when we're giving presentations. And um, I find him fascinating and I've, I've read his books. So yeah, I'm going to go with Frank Luntz. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate you talking to me, John. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to seeing, uh, you know, what polling results come out for the upcoming elections and various issues. And I look forward to continuing our conversation. Yeah, I hope so. Maybe when the book comes out, we can get more specific. Sounds great. I look forward to seeing it. Hey, thanks again. Thank you. Getting to AHA was brought to you by iResearch. To find out more about us, head to iResearch.com. And make sure to search for Getting to AHA in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else podcasts are found. And don't forget to click follow to ensure you don't miss any future episodes. Thank you for listening.